Hello everyone. Now we will continue our learning on reservoir simulation and we are still in the rock porosity chapter and now we will talk about porosity. Okay, so porosity may be already learned from reservoir engineering lecture and it's a quite simple parameter. So if you have this model of rock here, the total volume is bulk volume. We call it bulk volume. And then you see here, this one, these this balls are the grain, rock grain, and the volume of it, we call grain volume. And you see the pores or the spaces, okay, between, between the grains, we call it pore volume. The, the, the space or the voids, the volume of it, the volume of the voids is pore volume. Okay. So here you can see another picture of rock grain. The, the void, the space between the grains is the, the pores and the volume of it, we call it pore volume. Okay. So you can see this rock, we have these big holes, maybe this is the fog, but we have porosity or we have pores within this rock. And the mathematical formula, it's quite simple. So this is the symbol of porosity. It is the bulk volume minus the grain volume all divided by the bulk volume, or we can also say pore volume divided by the bulk volume. And this table is the typical porosity for different ethologies. So you can see for diatomite or and chalk, we can achieve 50 to 60% the porosity. For clean sandstone, maybe 25 to 30% typical sandstone. 15 to 25, so you can use this as a rule of thumb if you are not so sure about your porosity. Shelly sandstone, five to 15, tight gas, five to 12. Limestone can be, can be quite small, but can be big porosity also. Two to 15, fractured cell, and then colbate methane, you can see these numbers. These are the typical values. Okay, only the typical. So maybe you need to check in case by case basis. There can be different, but this is the typical values. All right, this is another representation. We have this one total volume of reservoir rock, or we can also call it bulk volume, the total volume of the rock. And we have grain volume or another term, matrix volume. Okay, so bulk volume minus the grain or the matrix volume is the pore volume, VP. Okay, yeah. Based on the origin of the porosity, we can divide porosity into two categories. The first one is primary porosity. And the second one is the secondary porosity. Primary porosity present at the time of deposit, okay? Present at the time the rock is deposited, okay? Thousands years ago, okay? Or many geologists say it's million years ago when the rock was deposited, okay? And usually primary porosity is quite homogeneous. But secondary porosity, it is generated due to alterations that occur after deposition. Okay, so it doesn't, it is not generated during the, the, the deposition time, but after that. Okay, and usually it is heterogeneous. So the porosity at one place will be different from another place. Okay, here yeah, for example, if you have reservoir here, 
and this reservoir suffers chemical process, geological process that that will create secondary porosity. Then the porosity in this zone can be different with the porosity in that zone. So this is the zone one, zone two, they can have different porosities because secondary porosity is heterogeneous. We find it in in terms of fractures, fissures, joint, solution flux, dolomitization, all of them result in secondary porosity. And it can be matrix and fracture porosity. So these are the primary and secondary porosities. And we can also divide or distinguish porosity into absolute and effective porosity. We start from the left picture. Again, this is the sand grain or rock grain. And here, okay, at the surface of each rock grain is the cement material. And then here, of course, we have the void space, which we call the porosity or the pores. And if the pores are connected, we call it effective or connected porosity system okay if they are connected so fluid can pass through them okay because they are connected but some porosity are ineffective because they are isolated they are not connected with other spaces or other porosity like this void space like this porosity we call it ineffective porosity and just a typical ratio, a typical value, effective porosity is bigger usually than the ineffective porosity. In this case, the effective porosity is 25% and in ineffective porosity is 5%. So the total porosity is 25 plus five, which is 30%, okay? And this one here, you can see dead end or cool the sac pore, the dead end or cool the sac pore. All right, then we go to the, the note on the left, absolute porosity. It's the total pore space, okay, divided by bulk volume. Effective porosity is the interconnected pore space divided by bulk volume. Pore space may be isolated due to due to cementation. Okay, due to cementation, the cement will 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 be the will will cover. Okay, will cover the rock grain and somehow maybe they are joined with each other. Okay, so at some point or at some space, the isolated pores will be will occur okay will be created okay and then isolated pore space doesn't contribute to recoverable fluid volume so this is very very important so although the pore space contain oil or gas but in terms of production they will not contribute to production because they are isolated they are not connected fluid cannot pass through them, okay? But we still can produce from the ineffective porosity if we perform stimulation technique, for example, by doing hydraulic fracturing, okay? So isolated pores can be unlocked by stimulation techniques like hydraulic fracturing. Yeah, this is another picture to show you the real picture of absolute and effective porosity. In this case, we are looking at a rock with isolated pore space and tight matrix. So the blue zone is actually the pores and the chocolate or the brown zone is the matrix or the grains. And of course, you, you, you are looking at many isolated pores, right? Just like a 
radial shape, something like this, they are not connected. So they, they will be ineffective in terms of production flow. Okay. And we find this case usually in tight reservoir or, or tight matrix. All right. High absolute porosity. Okay. Yeah, you can see many pore spaces. So in terms of absolute porosity, the, 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 the number is big, big absolute porosity, but virtually no effective porosity because they are not connected. Okay, there is no connection between each pore spaces. Okay, so I can say virtually no effective porosity results in very, very low or no permeability. Okay, so I hope it's quite clear. And this is the schematic diagram of pore spaces or pore types. All right. Here we have interconnected pore, right? They are connected so that fluid can, can flow through them, can pass through them. So this interconnected pore will be the effective pore. But some is isolated pore like this. In this case, the isolated pores are smaller than the connected pores, but we can also distinguish or we can also categorize another type of pore here we call it blind pore the dead end blind pore so fluid cannot pass through them this will be dead zone all right and another type of pore is subcapillary subcapillary pore okay so blind pore isolated pore and subcapillary pore are non-effective unfortunately not only isolated pore but also the blind pore and subcapillary pore they are all non-effective and again effective pore plus the non-effective pore become total rock pores okay so porosity, although it's quite simple, but it's not that simple in reality. Images and sketch map of rock pores. We can, we can just look and learn. Number or the A picture is the same micro photograph of pore body and pore throat. Okay, so I think this will be the pore throat and this is will be the pore body. Okay. So you see quite clearly. All right. This will be the pore throat. Okay, so we can more or less measure the the this the, the size of the pore throat. Okay, the like this. And through this port road, fluid can flow. And at point B, we have intergranular pores outlined in red. Okay. The intergranular pores. So intergranular pores are the, the pores that are existing between each grain. Okay. So this grain and this grain, the inter, the pores between each grain, we call it intergranular pores. So the pore is colored blue. And at point C, we have sketch map defining a pore throat, a throat and pore. So these are the throats. And this ball is the pore body. Okay. Okay, so this area is the pore body. And you can imagine, you can visualize on your mind. 
if this is the pore body, then we will have pore throat. Okay, connected with the pore body. And factors, the determining porosity, there are several factors. Grain size distribution, the packing or the sorting of the grains, grain shape, cementation, compaction, chemical dissolution that will result in secondary porosity and fracturing. This table is another tabulation of typical porosity ranges for each lithology for unconsolidated sands, reservoir sandstone, compact sandstone, down to conglomerate rock. These are just typical values, so you don't need to memorize them. Okay. But in case you need them, in case you don't have an actual number, you can go to these typical values so that you can use that, use them in your calculation or estimation. Porosity in classification. So we can classify porosity into several classes for clastic rock. First, clastic rock, we have very high porosity if the porosity is equals or more than 30%, then we will have high porosity between 10, 25 and 30, moderate porosity between 15 and 25, low porosity between 10 and 15, extremely low porosity between 5 to 10%, and ultra low porosity in shale reservoir, for example, lower than 5%. In carbonate rock, we have other classification, okay? High porosity, if the porosity is equal or more than 20%, moderate porosity, low porosity, extremely low porosity, you can refer to this table. And porosity model for Shelly Sand Reservoir. So let's say this block, is a unit bulk volume in Shelly Sand Reservoir. So you have sandstone reservoir, but in this sandstone reservoir, you find shales, and we call that rock Shelly Sand Reservoir. Okay, and of course, if we have this rock, okay, this rock will have volume, but if we break down the volume, this will be like this. First, we have the grain made of quartz, the main mineral, the dominant mineral for sandstone. And then we have mica, feldspar, organics. Quartz and mica, feldspar, organics are sand minerals. And then we have dry clay which which is made of clay minerals and then at the clay on the clay there will always be clay bond mineral clay bond water so water will cover the clay surfaces okay so we call it clay bond water water will attach on the on the clay okay attach or absorb or yeah water will cover the surface of the clay and of course mica dry clay and water on the clay clay bone water they have volumes okay and we call it if we sum all the volumes we call it shell volume okay and we have clay bone water plus non-clay water so it's free water and plus the oil and gas or the hydrocarbon okay if we sum all these spaces these volumes we call it total porosity so within the pores you will find hydrocarbon oil or or gas, you will find free water and you will find clay bond water. Okay, total porosity. But 
clay bone water will be will be in the ineffective porosity okay but for the effective porosity it will include the free water and the hydrocarbon for the effective porosity so it's just actually a model okay but it is a helpful model so you can distinguish between the volumes of quartz mica dry clay clay bone water free water and oil and gas and i said before that porosity is governed or determined by grain sorting or grain packing and this is the illustration from the left to the right porosity becomes larger from 5% to 35% and you can see the sorting from poorly sorting moderately sorting well sorting and very well sorting by sorting i mean the the size distribution okay if the distribution is good or quite uniform then you will have small uniformly or big uni uniformly like in this case all of the grains are quite big in size okay so if you have good sorting okay the grains are quite uniform in size all of them are quite big you will have high porosity but if the sorting is very poor you will have big and small at the same time and then the porosity will be small because the smaller grains will fill up the zones will fill up the pore spaces and of course at the end of the day the, the remaining porosity will be very small and along with the porosity the saturation profile will be will be the same more or less with the porosity so if you have poor sorting saturation can be very low but if you have good sorting the saturation can be can be high fluid saturation okay and based on the content of clay or fines if you have poor if you have poor sorting it means you have high clay content or high content of fines and vice versa okay this is another depiction of porosity the sorting of porosity if you have a uniform size okay if you have regular shape distribution or size distribution then you can achieve even 47.6 percent of porosity but of course it is just an ideal porosity usually cannot be that high then you can you can achieve 39.5 if you, if the configuration is like this if like this the sorting and the alignment can be 30 percent like this 25 percent the sorting the alignment or the packing of the grains if you have big and small at the same time we call it poorly sorting then porosity for example 13 percent much lower significantly lower than the previous cases and if you have irregular grain type grain shape then can be like this can be big or can be low porosity okay there are several methods to measure or to predict porosity of course we can do core analysis log analysis or we can also analyze or or predict the porosity from well performance okay for log you can obtain from open hole log neutron log density log sonic log and the cross plot by by plotting the log data okay but of course this will not be our topic because you already learned about this from i think formation evaluation class 
or petrophysiclase. Real porosity, okay, based on the lithology or the rock type, sand pack, you see Portland sand, gritting, and this visualization. We are looking at not the matrix, but actually only the pore space. So using laboratory technique, maybe using infrared, maybe, I'm not so sure. We can visualize the pore spaces. We can visualize the network of the pores. And after visualization, you can see the connection between the porosity like this. So we can say the effective porosity can be quite high in these three cases because as we can see they are quite connected right but some porosity can be ineffective okay for genetic types of reservoir rocks these are examples of real porosity Interparticle pores in sandstone, okay. Interparticle, okay. So porosity between, right? Inter means between, between particles or between grains. But there is also intra particle. Intra means in, in situ. So porosity inside the grain or porosity inside the the, the particle. This can occur due to dissolve dissolution. Okay, chemical process dissolution. So intraparticle in the dissolve, oh sorry, interparticle dissolve pore. Okay, pores that are generated due to dissolution process or chemical reaction process. This is the picture of in, intercrystalline pore in Dolostone. Okay pore between crystals, fenestral pores, the white areas, moldic pores, foggy pores, so foggy quite high, quite big porosity, tectonic fractures, you see the purple color, fractures that are generated due to tectonic phenomena, tectonic process, and also fracture due to dissolution, diagenesis process, maybe due to chemical reaction, maybe there, there was acidic water that will dissolve some of the rock grains, some of the rock matrix, so there will be dissolved fracture, which will be secondary porosity. Carbonate foggy porosity, Okay, so you see foggy porosity in carbonates and many of them are disconnected. Many of them are ineffective. Okay, this is depiction of double porosity. So this one is real porosity from the visualization. You can see the matrix and pores here so it's this one matrix porosity and also fracture porosity the bigger porosity okay so that's why we call it double porosity because there is matrix porosity okay porosity between the matrix and fracture porosity but of course, in the simulation, we cannot we cannot copy and paste from the real picture into the model, into the software. We will do averaging. So there, so it will be like this schematically. Okay, so there will be space here for fracture porosity, and here matrix porosity and this is one minus fracture porosity okay 
porosity averaging, porosity of the normally distributed. Okay, so normal distribution. So by normal distribution means if you have of if you have learned about statistics, there will be like bell shape, bell curve. Okay, normal distribution. Okay, so many of the many of the porosity will be at the center of this distribution. Simplest averaging method is of course arithmetic. Averaging should be based on thickness. Okay, so this is the calculation method. So this is the summation of thickness or thickness one multiplied by porosity one. You sum all of them divided by the summation of the thickness. So it's like if you have two porosity sizes, then it will be H1 porosity one plus H2 multiplied by porosity two, all of them divided by H1 plus H2. If you have two rock samples with different thickness, different porosity, then the average porosity you calculate with this method. And similar, similarly, for the average water saturation, we calculate it in that way also. But the formula is thickness multiplied by porosity multiplied by the water saturation for each category, maybe or for each identity, for example, H1, porosity one, water saturation one, plus number two, plus number three, and the summation, you sum all of them and then divide by the summation of porosity and the thickness, something like this. But you will multiply them with water saturation, okay? All right, so we have covered the topic of porosity and the next topic is about permeability okay